You're right. OK, is that what you're saying? If you're doing a smart move, then you need to know. But if you don't, if you just need to return a move, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter. OK, yes. If, if, what you're, if you're not writing an intelligent game, then you don't really need to know who's next, right? So you just return any random location that's not already used. Mm -hmm. You're right. Then you actually don't need it. But my assumption was that it might be useful to you to know who, who, whose turn it is when you make that decision, just in case you decide to make it a little bit smarter. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're right. If you just want to return just a stupid move as long as it's empty, yes, you don't actually need is x. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather you put it in there. Just, and I'd always, of course, I'd rather you put some logic that makes a better decision than just the first empty one. Fair? Okay, the second thing. Um, a few of you have come to me and said, I don't need a, an is x in my function because I already have a, a variable that I can refer to from my function. In other words, where you've created your function, outside of that, you already have some notion of whose turn it is. And you can use that to decide if, the, use, you know, if it's x or o. I still want you guys to have a local variable. Local as in have your function have its own variable. Does anyone know why it's better to have a local variable over using a global one? OK, here's what I mean by a global variable. Look, suppose you have this. If I called next move, what would I see on the screen? Huh? True. Well, remember how scoping works, right? Is x is a variable. We check in here. Is is x created anywhere inside of the function? Yes or no? No. So we go up. Right? So we go up and we say, oh, there it is. And it's true, so we, we alert true. Right? Now suppose, though, I had a local, or let's call this, just to avoid confusion, um, balls. OK, here now I pass false. False. And here I do balls. What will I see on the screen? Oh, sorry. Yes, you're right there. OK. Now what will I see on the screen? False. 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 By the way, it wouldn't be error. It would be undefined for those of you who are curious. OK. So you're right. I will see false. Now let's do this. Is, what is is x? OK, let's remember this. What is bubbles? This bolus, which is whatever I pass here, right? This is this. So now, what is this? It's this. It's not this. It's this. And what is this? The value that I pass in here. It's the name of the value that is passed into the hole. It's not this. Does that make sense? Remember the rule. Is is x created in this context? Yes or no? Yes, it's right here. So you don't go here. You stay here. And you use whatever this is. And what is the value of this? It's whatever is passed into the hole. It's the name of the value that is passed inside. It's the name given to this. This goes in here and then is used here. Make sense? Yes? OK. So now, in your homeworks, I asked you to do implement a function like this that takes a board and is x. Some of you are saying, but I already have a global variable in my game called is x. Why can't I just use that one? Why do I need another local variable? Let me explain why. Suppose I took your next move. And I 
took it out of your application and I put it into a different application. And in that application, I don't have a global is x variable. You with me? So I take this code and I copy it. Sorry, suppose you're doing this. Is x. I then take your code. This, what would this do? If I ran this, what would it do? Alert true, good. Now I take your function and I put it into a different file. Wait. I put it here. If I call next move here, what will I get? Error. Error. There is no is next, is x. Right? It doesn't exist anywhere. It's, it's not a variable, it's not anything. It's completely, it doesn't exist. It would say it's an, uh, it's an uncreated un identifier. You can't do that. So I would get an error. Why? Because my function relies on some other thing existing. Wait. If I, however, did this, let's call it is local to avoid confusion. And then I called it with is x here. What would this return? What would this alert? Is x is true, right? So it's the same thing as doing this. Yes? Okay, so if I call next move with a true, true go, ah. Okay, is x here, it goes in here, and it's true, and so we alert. Good, now I take this, and I move it into a different application. Okay. Now I try to run it. Assuming I give it the right arguments, like true, will it work? Yeah. It doesn't rely on my application having any specific variable. It becomes more generic. It becomes more reusable. Its dependency on my code is weaker, which is a good thing. Does it make sense at all? Raise your hand if you, this actually made sense to you. Wow, more than I thought. Okay, for those of you for whom it did not make sense, relax, it's not going to be on the quiz. But when you structure your code, it's important to pay attention to these things. When you write your functions, have them be as isolated from the rest of your system as possible. That way you can reuse them more often. Okay? Yeah? Okay, imagine this. Imagine I wrote a function that adds two values. Wait. Oops, moment. Let me give you a good example. Suppose I want to implement a sum function. Const sum. Oh, sorry. Uh, product. Okay. Um, and now I call product. Okay, or I call it with a nine, whatever. Okay, so nine times six, 54, right? Okay, so if I call this, this will return 54, yes? Is this function super usable? No, because it relies on x. So if I ever took this function and I wanted to use a multiplication somewhere else, I can't use it because it will only work if I happen to have an x in that context. Kind of weird, right? Whereas, if I had a local variable, x, or x local, and I passed in x, now this is reusable. I can use this anywhere, right? Anywhere I go, I can throw this in there, give it two numbers, and it will return the product. You see how I've just made it more usable? Go. You're right, but then it's... Okay, if I wanted to always multiply by 6, yes, you're right, then that's okay. This is okay as long as the behavior you want is for it to always multiply by 6. 
But if you want it to be more flexible, to multiply by 5, multiply by 4, then you have it be a variable here. And you can move this out here. And if I wanted to multiply by whatever x is, I do that. If I want to multiply by 8, I do that. If I want to multiply by 2, I do that. And in all contexts, it will work. Again, to recap, when you write a function, it should, as much as possible, contain within it everything it needs to work. Rely on stuff outside of it as little as you possibly can. With me? For those of you who are with me, the more you rely on things outside of it, that is called tight coupling. Having a dependency outside of your area is called coupling, tight coupling. In programming, you want loose coupling. In other words, you want to minimize the dependencies outside of your function. Okay? Okay. It's not going to be on the test, relax, but you should know it. Okay? That's good, sir. It makes sense? Did it make sense? Yeah, I'm talking to you. No, because you asked. That's why I don't want to make sense. Okay. Um, so, in your homeworks, even if you think the variable doesn't make sense, or you don't need it, or, I don't know, you already have a global one, still, please, have the local version. Okay? Okay. Now, as far as the functions, what is the role of next move? What does next move, what is next move supposed to do? To return a location. Is it supposed to change the board? No, right? So next move should not call make move. Next move, think of next move as you're playing chess and you have a friend. And your friend standing there says, move your horse, you know, over there. Next move is that friend. He doesn't reach over and change the board, right? Hopefully. He just tells you, hey, maybe you should move your horse. Next move is that, it's the device. It's saying, do this. Make move is the actual movement on the board. It's where you're actually changing the board. That's the difference. Got it? Next move tells you where to go. Make move actually changes the board itself. Is that part clear? Yes? Good. Um, any other questions about the homework? The simulation, the game, any of that. Is that clear? It's due tomorrow. You know that, right? The deadline is tomorrow, right? So, you're good? You got it? No questions? Okay. All right. So, okay, good. So in the last class, we, were, we began this talking about Java, a programming language called Java, which even though it shares a similar name with JavaScript, is actually a very different language. Can someone tell me one important way in which Java is different from JavaScript? Okay, so I'm hearing a few. Th so the thing that I think you were implying, and I heard it here too, is it's a strongly typed language. Mm -hmm. Whereas JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. I'd like you to memorize that. Okay? JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. Remind me, what do I mean by dynamically typed language? The type of the variable can change, exactly, dynamic. It's flexible, it changes, right? And the type of the variable is determined in JavaScript by what? How do I know if the variable has a value of number or a string? Right, but it's determined by the value. In other words, if you just do, you know, let x and you put into it a five, the type is a number. If you then put into it a string, the type is a string. So the type is determined by the value that you put inside. With me? So in this way, because the type can change, 
It's a dynamically typed language. Java, on the other hand, is a strongly typed language. What do I mean by strongly typed language? We have to define the variable. Right. You have to say up front, in the beginning, what the type of the variable is going to be. And that cannot change. So if you say x is an integer, that's it, x is an integer. And you can only put into it integers. So if I get int x you know, equals a string, is that OK? No. So if I did this, int you know, x is yay, why is this not OK? Right, because x is expecting a number, an integer, and I'm trying to put into it a string. It's a mismatch of types. You cannot do that. You can only put into it. Now, as far as a computer is concerned, when we say int x, what are we doing? Think of memory. What do you think we're doing? We're allocating memory. So think of memory is just a bunch of places where you put zeros and ones, right? So when we create a variable, remember what a variable is. It's a container in which you can put things, right? Well, specifically in programming, a variable is a container that's stored in memory. So when you say, I want to store an int, it allocates or it reserves a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of bits that it can modify to store the value that you put inside. So if you try to put in there something that doesn't match, it's going to reject it. It's going to say, I only know how to store numbers because integers because that's how much room I took. I can't store other things. If you want a string, okay, allocate another piece of memory for a string. Make sense? Imagine if you create a boolean, which only takes eight bytes, oh, uh, sorry, one byte, and you try to store inside of it a long, which allocates, let's see how many bytes, eight bytes. Doesn't fit, right? The box is too small. Remember when we were talking about how variables, a variable is like a box you can put stuff inside? Remember that? Think of it this way. By specifying the type, you're defining the size of the box. Okay? The, and the second thing you're doing is not only the size, you're, only, you're also specifying what can go inside. You're saying only numbers can go in here, or only booleans can go in here, or only strings can go in here. Right? Strongly typed. Got it? Yes? And how does JavaScript work? Good question. So how does, I don't honestly know how JavaScript does things underneath, but I'm guessing it allocates the memory at runtime. In other words, it doesn't allocate memory and then put things inside. It allocates the memory the moment it gets the value. So it gets the value, it allocates that much memory and throws it in, which is less performant. It's not as fast as allocating and just throwing it in, right? Okay. Um, any questions? Do you guys now at this point? Yeah, go. What if we don't put the quotes? Would that work? If I just put... What do you mean? If I just put X as yay? Yeah. Okay, what do, you think the, what do you think Java thinks yay is? Variable variable. It's trying to think, yeah, it kind of, actually, at this point, it doesn't even know what it is. It see, it can't resolve to a variable. You see this error? It thinks it's a variable that you never declared. So it's an error. If I made the variable like this, int yay, then that's okay, because this is the same thing as doing this, right? Under, makes sense, yes? Okay. Um, so you understand the difference between a dynamically typed language and a strongly typed language, yes? Now following that, what you said was that when you make a function in the same way that you, when you make a variable, have to say the type, when you make a function, you have to say, if you have arguments, what those variable types are. So if I wanted to create a function that adds two numbers together, uh, sum, and it takes two numbers, like num1 and num2, I have to say what these two are, right? So suppose I wanted to add two integers. What do I do? 
I have to say this is an int and this is an int. Int. Okay. And now I want to return num1 plus num2. I get an error. Why? Exactly, because this is saying this function is going to return void, which means nothing. But I'm returning a number, right? An int plus an int equals an int. So I have to change this to an int. So now all is good. This is saying I will take two ints and I will return an int. Very cool. Any questions so far? Uh, if it's greater than an int, you mean it doesn't fit in an int, you're going to get an error. If you ever try to... Yeah, if you ever try to put any... Because if you think about it, returning an int implies an int, right? So if you return something that is greater than an int, but you're saying int, that's an error. So if you want to do that, what you could do is do long, which is a much bigger than an int. So before we move forward, I want to go over some of the types that exist in JavaScript. So we talked about int, which is an integer, which intuitively you guys understand, right? It's an integer, it's a number. But it has a very finite set. In other words, it, the smallest number you can have is this, and the largest number you can have is this. If you want a number that is bigger than that, use a long. Now remember, Every time you make one of these, you allocate memory, right? You take up, you reserve memory. Uh, an int reserves four bytes. How many bits is that? Four times eight. 32 bits. So 32 bits are used to represent this as the smallest number and this as the biggest number. Okay. So then, if, you, if that's not enough, if you want a number that's even bigger, you have to use a long. A long uses eight bytes. How many bits is that? Eight times eight, 64, right, 64 bits. And the smallest number is this massive thing, and the largest number is that really massive thing. Right, okay. Um, eight, oh, oops, I forgot the eight there. Okay, so that a long is a very large number, right? You can fit a lot. Now, be careful. Now, you might say, why don't I just be safe and always use a long? Right? Never worry about having a, big, a number that is too big. Why don't I never use an int, just always use a long? What is the problem with that? It uses more memory that you don't need. So what? Why is that a problem? Because, because you only have so much memory. You have a finite amount of memory. If you just keep using up massive chunks of memory for no reason, you might actually run out of memory. And if you run out of memory, your application dies. It crashes. Make sense? OK. Um, and then if you want to use decimals, if you have kind of a smaller decimal, one that only has like seven decimal places, you can use a float. If you want one that is much larger, 16 decimal places, you can use a double. So that is the difference between a float and a double, is a double has more precision than a float. Make sense? Okay, so wait. If I wanted to represent a decimal, what type would I use? Float or? Double. If I wanted to use a very, if I wanted a very large integer, what would I use? Long. If I wanted to use sort of an average sized integer? Int. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, if I wanted to use a true or false, what type would I use? Boolean. Okay, not bad. There's another type we have not talked about. It's called char. Char stands for character. Okay? Huh? Yeah, like any one character. So in JavaScript, we didn't have a notion of a character. We just had a string with one thing in it, right? What's a Unicode character? Huh? Is it, is it a Unicode character? Uh, I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm confused what you're saying. It's just the way you make it is you just do this. Char, char. Let's say A is. Are two 
um, it's now if the max it uses two bytes, so anything beyond that, it's not going to work. Did I answer your question with that? Okay. Look at the syntax though. It's interesting. Strings use double quote. Chars use single quote. Yes. Okay. So a string is not a primitive type. A string in in is actually an object. So you can do this. Notice the difference between this and this. What differences do you notice? A string is uppercase, right? You notice that? Int is lowercase, string is uppercase. The difference is that string is an object. Int is a primitive type. Okay? String is an object, int is a primitive type. What is an object again? Think back to JavaScript. What was an object? It's like a but it's like a container that has inside of it key value pairs, right? A name and a value, name and value. And the value can be anything else. It can be another object. It can be a function. It could be primitive types. It can be anything you want. Remember that? Some of that applies here too. The way we make objects is going to be different, and we'll talk about that later. But the idea is the same. You have a container that has inside of it data and functions. Clear? Question so far? Okay. So, um, byte and short are very rarely used, honestly. It's good to know they exist, but they're just, a byte is a really small number, just 128 to negative 127. Um, and then short is just two bytes, so it's just a little bit more than that. And then int is, most commonly, you use ints in Java. So if you're ever going to use a number, make sure you know int, and it bless you. And if you're using decimals, double is very common. Okay? So I want you guys to definitely know int and double. Everything else you'll learn over time. Um, char, don't worry about it. Boolean, know it. So know boolean, int, and double. Everything else you'll kind of figure out as you go. Cool? Yes? Um, let me get rid of this. Okay, so here you understand that you're making a variable of type string, which is an object, and we're putting inside of it a string with double quotes. This is fine, right? You guys know this. Numbers. I'm making a double, double precision decimal, A, and another one, B. You can cast. What do we mean by casting? It's a conversion, okay? Now question, if I were to cast or to convert a B, which is a double, which is a decimal, into an integer, what do you think I would get? Five. Right. Six. Well, it's not, wait, okay. Wait for it. Um, Okay, see this five? The reason for this is some of you guys said six because you thought it rounds. It doesn't. It literally just looks at the number and takes the integer. Got it? Okay, so that's what that does. Um, and so by doing that, if I were to then take, take the integer of, of B, which would give me five, and then add five to B, to C, what do you think I would get? Well, you're already seeing it. <laughs> okay, you understand. So you would get 4.5 plus 5.683, that's A and B, and C would be 5. So it would be 5 plus 5.683 plus 4.5. Yes? Print down the lessing. Huh? Call this. Rebe, Rebe cast on the muscle. Print line needs heto. I think it's steh. Ah, science? Ha, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So here, if we do. There. 
Is that right? Yes. Five plus five plus four point five. Yes. Exactly. 0.5 will go away. So if I do that, I think that's right. F11. Pointing Gahanets. Jishta. You can also go the other way around, right? Is you can cast an integer to a double. What do you think would result in that? Wait, let me. So if I did int, you know, z is 8, then I did double, uh, zd is double z. System.out.println uh, zd. What will I see on the screen? Eight point zero. Makes sense. It's still eight, but it has a decimal. Now, suppose, suppose, I want to divide two integers, and I want to get the decimal result, not the integer result, but the decimal result. So, suppose I want to. to I haven't. Um, let's divide these numbers. Meet up, uh, so divide. So here I do div, and I give it two numbers like four and eight. There. If I run this, what will I get? Well, let's see. Zero. Good. Can anyone tell me why? Right, an integer divided by an integer yields an integer. Makes sense, right? Okay, so what can I do? Right, so let's change the integer to a decimal. Let's cast it, if you will, convert it into a decimal. So let's do double to double. In Chechen. Now we get 0 0.5. You want to keep this as an int? OK, in that case, what you have to do is you have to say double result, and then you have to return casting that to an int. But the, what will this return? Because result gets. 0.5, casting 0.5 to an int will yield what? 0. 0. 0.5 as an integer is 0. Go. OK. Good. OK. What do you think? Look. What is an int divided by an int? An int, right? So then you take that result. And you and you cast it to a double. How's that, Sasha? Okay. Okay. Other questions regarding? Uh, yes. If you have two decimal now, if you have two doubles. Wait, I'm, I'm trying to reproduce what you said. I'm calling this with what two numbers? Yeah, and 0 0.5. Like that? Oh, sorry. So 0 0.5. Okay, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Ah, I see. Yes, it will work. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So you're saying double. Um, so let's use a double here. You're saying double result is this. And then you're saying if result is a 5, 
then print yay. This was your question? Yes. Okay. Yay. You understand why? Yeah? Um, you could. In some programming languages, it's. Oh, you mean you have to do this? After yes, in in Java too. If you go beyond that, you're gonna, you're going to have problems. As long as you stay within the six, because a double is exactly that. It's sixteen precision, right? It's okay. So double bytes, two bytes. Um, if you go beyond that, you're going to have problems. Yeah, go. Yeah, how do you check if something is a type? This I don't remember, honestly. One second. A variable in, I think, yeah, I think there is a type of, but I forgot what the primitive, in Java. How do I know that the variable type in Java? Really? Okay, you can check this way, but can you do that with primitives? Hang on. So can you do um, system dot out dot print line result instance of double? I don't think you can do that. Yeah, you can't do that. I don't know. I'll I'll figure it out and I'll tell you next class. Yeah, I, I honestly don't remember. Um, okay, other questions? It's not necessary. Where? In your turn. Here? Mm -hmm. no, here? In your turn. Oh, here. You don't want to. If you cast this to a, to an int, this means take the result of this and cast it to an int, right? And you return that. Um, but it's already parsed, so it's not Right. So you're you're casting five point zero to five. But then you're casting it again because you're returning a double, right? So you're casting five back to five point zero. You could also do this. Now you're just returning five. Yes. Back when when it was du returning double. Yeah. Uh, how did it equal to five an integer five? Okay. Wait. Ah, I see what you mean. So you're asking this, if this is returning five, if the result is here, 5.0, how is it that I'm saying 5.0 is equal to five? Is 5.0 equal to five? That's why. Um, don't, okay. You're checking numeric values, right? You're checking values of two things. And when it comes to numbers, you're checking the quantity of one and the quantity of the other. And if the quantities, regardless of the precision, are exactly the same, then they're the same. So no casting is needed for the issue Right. So in other words, I see what you're saying. You're saying, um, imagine you have a double ZZ which had a 1, and an int ZZ1 which had a 1. Can you do ZZ is equal to ZZ1? Is this your question? Okay. Yay. Make sense? You can also do a long here. Wait. Here, let's have this be point zero. Okay, and so Z1 is equal to ZZ2. Yay. Jokes? Okay. Do you guys understand? Did everyone understand his question? What he's saying is ZZ is a double containing a 1. Z1 is an integer containing a 1. And long is a long, which containing a 1. Are they actually the same when compared? And the answer is yes, because they have the same values. Now, if you did this, and then you ran it. Now you don't get yay because, of course, 1.1 .1 is not equal to 1. Make sense? Yes? Yes? I think we have done it. I was having a shunning that type 
Չէ, չէ, արժեքներնա, վալու, նյու մեր թվային արժեքնա ստուգում, ո, գեն, ադեր կվաշտենց, կիկ կանին, ես, Can you compare a boolean to a number? I think you can, but you sh you're probably going to get false every time. So uh, let's do, I don't know, int zero uh, or int x1 be zero and have boolean um, x2 be true. And let's compare, or, or false, sure. And let's see if x1 is equal to x2. This should not, Huh, it actually gives you an error. Interesting. I didn't know this. It doesn't allow you to compare two things that are not the same. Because it's always going to be false. So it's assuming it's a programming error and just giving you an error. But if it allowed it, it would still be false. So you, it's always false. You understand? So j remember in JavaScript, uh, it does some trickery if you do double equals. That does not exist in Java. It, it is exactly what it is. Ինչ հանենք ճանը։ Ձրոն ինչ սարկենք։ Ձրոն ոտ կարվ է սարկենք։ Իկ մեկը երևի։ Հապայց Իկ մեկը ինթա։ Ակզակլի։ Այդ, սո դես նո, մեմբր չրութի վալսի վալյուս, դոս դոն եկզիստ։ Իտի էվ չրու որ վալս։ Ակզ Other questions? Yes. Yes, of course. You can compare two numbers, any number. You can compare boolean's. You can compare um, char characters. Any of these? Yes. Go. Is it possible in this case uh, using three uh, equal signs? No, no three. There's no three equal signs in Java. In Java, only two. And it works the same way as three in JavaScript. It's the same. Yeah, two here is the same thing as three there. Uh, other questions? Yes. What does one equal sign do? In an if, it's it tries to assign, and maybe it returns. I don't know. I've never tried. Let's see. So let's have x one be equal to one. What does that do? Cannot convert from an int to a boolean. Yeah, because the result of this has to be a boolean for if to know yes or no, right? So we're trying to, you understand? No, you can't. So you can't. Uh, other questions? This is bad. Don't do that. How's it going, Mike? Okay. I can either continue reviewing this or we can move forward. Raise your hands if you want me to do more more of this. Okay, let's keep going. So again, just to recap very quickly. In Java, we have variables that have to be typed. You can put different values into these variables just like you can in JavaScript, but they have to match the type that you specified. You can cast in Java. That is to say, if you have, for example, a double precision number, you can convert that into an integer. Or you can convert an integer into a double precision number. Keep in mind, if you cast to a less precision number, you will lose some of the value of that number. You will lose some of the precision. Fine? Okay. So, yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. So instead of the C, if we like, uh, set that from this point on, B is always an integer. Like, can we not cast it to C to a new variable, but say that the previous V will always be an integer? Wait, so B is a double. Yeah. Here, when you cast it, you're not changing B. You're saying, have this return an integer that I then put into C. Yeah, but can we like, just change B instead of like, casting it to C? 
Well, you can't change B to an int because it's already a double. You can't change the type once you've specified it. So what you can do is make another variable like C and put the integer version of B into it. But you can't change B. B is Once it's a double, it stays a double. Yeah. Remember, it's not dynamically typed. It's, it has strong typing. So once you specify a type, you're done. You can't change it. OK, John? Yes. Can you convert a number to a boolean? So you're saying, can I do b is the boolean equivalent of, say, c? This? Let's see what cannot cast from int to a boolean. No. Other questions? Keep going? OK. Uh, let me get rid of. OK. So have a look at this one. Remember that the comparison operator returns a Boolean. So if A trip double equals B, what does that mean? It means is A equal to B? A is a 3, B is a 3. Or is 3 equal to 3? Yes. So what does this return? This right here. True. Good. So B, B is true. So then I say is A equal to B? So is 3 equal to 3? True. And remember, this is the same Boolean operators that you've seen in JavaScript. And A is equal to C. Is A equal to C? No. And not BB. So BB was true, so we flip it and make it false. But because this is false, we're done. We stop. Right? OK, so it's not this one. Then we say, is A not equal to C? Is that true? Yes. So we go to this one, and we get they are different. So let's run it. Um, they are different. Notice that the syntax here is pretty much exactly the same as what you get in JavaScript. Again, the only difference is we use double instead of triple equals. Greater than, less than, it's all the same. Yes? Why do we need it? Um, OK, suppose we had this. A is equal to B, A is equal to C. BB was true, we flip it, we make it false. Are there any questions in this code? It's exactly JavaScript, but it's typed. That's the only difference. Half set gone? OK, let's keep going. So you know how to do conditionals in Java. You know variables in Java, and you know the conditionals, yes? And you understand functions in Java, that you have to specify the return type and the argument types. Yes? OK, not bad. Let's look at arrays. So remember, every time you make a variable, you have to say what it is, right? Now remember how I told you that when you allocate an integer, it takes up memory? It allocates a certain amount of memory, remember? When you allocate an array, it has to know how much memory to allocate. For the same reason. So if you say, it's I have a list of numbers, it's going to ask you what kind of number and how many. And what it will do is, let's say an integer takes up four bytes. If we allocate a list of five, how many bytes did we allocate? Four times five. You see how this works? So what this is saying is, it's saying, give me a list of numbers. Allocate for me a list of numbers, an array of numbers, specifically five of them. Remember how in JavaScript we could make an empty array and just keep adding to it? You can't do that here. You have to say the size of your array. And then you can only modify things within that array. You can't go outside. You can't just keep adding. 
So in this case, I've made an empty array of five integers, and it has a dot length. Look, we know that, right? Just like in JavaScript, it has a dot length. Then, just like in JavaScript, we can now modify values at any particular index, and we can read values at any particular index exactly the same way as in JavaScript. Exactly the same way. But again, you can only go as far as much as you've allocated. If I did this, this will give me an error. Let's see. Oh, um, no. Okay, but it gave me an error and it broke on the debugger. Okay, don't worry. Basically, it gave me an error. It, don't worry. You're not allowed to do this. Why am I not allowed to do this? Exactly, because I've only allocated five space, five numbers, room for five numbers, right? And the indexes are zero to four. So the moment I do more than four, it's an error. Go. Wait, there's a question. Awesome. No. Okay, so remember how in JavaScript things that were empty were considered to be like undefined? They were undefined? I think, it, I think it's null. Although it's integer, wait, wait, spasek, miropa. Uh, let me print the index of five. Oh, sorry, printed. Wait, array of Miropa. Wait, 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 one moment. Ah, wait, wait, wait. Ah, zero. It's the zero. Sorry. Uh, boom. Okay. So by default, int, I guess, has a number zero. Right? So if you if you allocate an array of eight integers, you get eight zeros. And then you can modify them as you like. You go first. Uh, don't we have specific functions in uh, Java to add the array? Yes. Like yes, like push. Yeah. OK. You're asking what methods exist for an array? Uh, hang on. Java array. Wait. Ah, Java array methods. Array. Come on. Ta -ta -ta. Okay, so it has all of these. Uh, equals, equals, fill. Oh my god, sort. Yes. Yeah, pleasure. The answer to your question, yes. <laughs> All of these functions exist uh, attached to it. Oh, here we go. Look, it's all these. Wait, what the heck is this stuff? This I don't know. But anyway, but this stuff. One of which is called to string. You know what that does? Every time you cast a, um, an array to a string, it will call the toString function, which will return a string. Make sense? Go. Uh. Can't. Nope. You can only have the one thing. Go. Array in co object elements. Uh, ah, jista, jista, jista. It's primitive, na, and you say object na. Jista is awesome. But I S I S lang, I S lang. What Carlos? Jista. What a super class object. Jista, jista, jista. Go, uh, go. Vora. S? Okay, uh, we'll talk about what new does in other contexts. Specifically here, just assume for now that new means make, uh, make, create. 
So you're saying create an, an integer array with eight values in it. Just assume that's what it means. Yeah? Okay. Uh, other, qu yes? Can you pass an array to a function? Of course. Easily? Easily. You just say, just like here, look, string actually took an array. But let's make another. Public static void foo, which takes an integer array a. And let's say that system dot out dot print line of a. And now we call foo with r. Let me get rid of this. And wait, they are different. Oh, did I change it? Sorry. There we go. Octa print line. Huh. Okay, wait, 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 wait. There we go. Uh, let's print the second one. So the second one should have 44, right? Uh, one should have 44. There you go. Jaminat Chunek. Sorry. Sorry, it's Jaminat. It's Office Hours, like a card trick. Uri Shards? Cool. Okay. Good. Um, let's get rid of this. Okay, listen, there are two ways you can do this. One, guys, look, here you're making an empty array, an array, an array containing eight integers, right, which by default are zero, right? You can also create an array that already has values inside. In JavaScript, you would do this. You'd say, like, const r2 is, you know, one, two, three, or three, four, five, right? This is how you would do it in JavaScript, yes? This is the same thing in Java. You're saying the type is an integer array, and here are the values, one, two, three, four, and five, with curly braces. With curly braces. Question, what is the length of this array? One, one, the length, one, two, three, four, five. So what is the biggest index I can refer to? Four. Four. What is the lowest index I can refer to? Zero. Good. If I refer to eight index, what will happen? Error. error. Right. I would get an error. Good. Okay. That's it. That's always. So it's not an object in the error. Huh? It's not an object in the error. Why did it Oh, hang on. One at a time. No, no, this is not, don't confuse that with, remember in Java, you could, JavaScript, you could make an object. No, you can't do that here. There's a bunch of guys. I'll say it. Can you cast this to a string? I think you can do, wait. Uh, one second, control F11. Fuck. You know, there's got to be a way to pretty print an array. With a loop? That's fun such guy in short works, I will think. Array dot stringify in short listen. Shit. Okay, love. Okay, we'll make a function. You know what? Let's make a function right now that prints just the array. So, let's do um, void print array. What does this take as an argument? An array. Well, an int, let's say, array. Okay, I want to print every character on the screen. How do I do that? For int i have equal to zero, if i is smaller than array, don't wait. i plus plus two. Uh-huh. If I do print like this, it will print next to, e next to each other, right? 
So why don't I just call that now? Um, so let's write, there you go. Uh, Arias Mechatronic, Miropa. Yeah, 33, 44, whatever. Now, if you want to add commas in between, of course, we can do that by doing system, ah. mm -hmm. system dot out dot print line, like that. But then, what will happen if I print this? What will, what will happen? All right, and this? You see this? Okay, how do I get rid of that? If i is equal to, oh, equal to r dot length minus one, sorry, if it's not equal to that, only then add it. So add it in all instances except the last one. Boom. Exactly. There we go. Good. Uh, is this clear? How's that gone? Inch, inch? What object? Yeah, but not yet. Creating an object involves using a template, which I'll discuss later. Chat object chat tensor yeah. Yeah. Uh, other questions? If you just do, you mean if you just do this? Like that? No, no, no. Without curly braces, just write one, two, three, four, five, six. You can't. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, other questions? Okay, good. So you understand arrays and you understand loops, by the way. Nice. Okay. Okay, so let's. Okay, loops. What are the. Wait, don't. How do I make you not look? What are the first. Uh, what are the three kinds of loops that we know? We don't know. Okay, other than recursion. I mean, the. Uh, huh? For while and do while. Guess what? For loop, while loop, do while loop. I'll just leave it here for a second for you to look at and realize you know it. You realize you know it? Cool, right? Let's keep going. Um, in so one way to iterate over an array was using a for loop, right? The loop that we mentioned where you create an i and you increment the i and you make sure i is less than the length. Another way you can do this is using this, this new uh, syntax. You know what? Screw it. Don't worry about it. Just use a for loop for now. It's fine. Um, okay, so we all understand loops. Any questions? Good. Easy. Um, Miropa, Incher, Region Incher, Jana, Inchka. Oh, you mean code collapsing? Ha! Huh. That's see this. That's what you mean. Oh, you mean in the comments you can. Hence it. Ha! It but it eclipse not all. It blows me messy. It editor not all. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Inchka. You have Okay. So the question was, does Java contain recursion? It has functions, right? And functions can call other functions, right? Remember, main was calling that foo. Well, if a function can call a function, then just as easily a function can just call itself because it's just another function. So yes, you can absolutely have it. In fact, why don't we do that? Wait. Why don't we? Um, 
Let's do factorial. Um, so int uh, num. And let's call our factorial system.out.println uh, fact of 5. OK, help me implement the factorial function. Huh? Now what? Okay. Heto. Return on e. Heto. I have a function. Give us inch kill me. But then Sara will test chill me. There you go. And now if we run this. What? Oh. 120. Recursion. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, do you not see how this is exactly the same as what you wrote before? This is, wait, let me just write the JavaScript version and you guys understand how it's the same. Cause fact. Okay, this is JavaScript, this is Java. Again, notice the differences. This is typed, this is not. This is typed, this has no return type. The rest, this code is exactly the same as this code. Cool? Congratulations, you're learning a new language. Kind of cool. Okay, it's 2.42, I think we're good. Uh, any questions before we conclude today's talk? At all? This is okay? Okay, question to you. Isn't this awesome? Wait, just step back for a moment and forget like all the weird, like. You guys learned one thing, right? JavaScript. And suddenly, in like two lectures, you know a lot. Like, you can already start programming in a different language. You're one step away from C. If you understand this and you understand strict typing and memory allocation and so on that we're talking here, C is just one more step after that. Basically, the big thing about C is they have this notion of pointers, which is like memory references. But beyond that, it's almost this. So already you're this far away from knowing Java, from knowing C++. C sharp is almost exactly like Java with a few tweaks. With a few tweaks. Okay, so you, I, cause I know because I learned C sharp right after Java and it was like this. Okay, so you're this far away from knowing JavaScript C++, Java, C Sharp. If you know JavaScript, Python is not that difficult. Python is already on your radar. So if you try and you put some effort into it, you can, within the next year, know five languages. Okay, next two years. Okay, next three years. Okay, four years. The point is, by the time you graduate, if you know five languages, that's pretty darn good. And it's this far away. Okay, let's take a photo. <laughs>